July 1973, New Haven, Connecticut. In broad daylight, a young woman is brutally murdered in a downtown parking garage. Witnesses see the suspect escape. Forensics discover a trail of evidence, including blood and fingerprints. But it's not enough to capture the killer. Police turn to the world of the paranormal to help solve the case. A psychic's cryptic clues create more questions than answers. But will they catch the murderer and bring solace to a town cloaked in fear? July 16, 1973, New Haven, Connecticut. Penny Sarah is a 21-year-old dental assistant. In her high school yearbook, she describes herself as having a laughing heart and merry spirit. Since her mother passed away 10 years earlier, she's been a constant support to her father and young sister. On this day, she's taken time off work to go shopping for furniture. She pulls in on the top floor of Temple Street parking garage. She gets out, and before there's time to lock the car, she's attacked. In the struggle, the attacker's hand is cut. The young woman manages to escape to a stairwell, but her assailant corners her and stabs her through the heart. As far as Detective George Mazikane was concerned, this case was going to be a piece of cake. We had five people who had witnessed the portions of the incident as it occurred. We had the blood type. We had fingerprints. We had everything but his name and address. Police even had a suspect, Penny's on-off boyfriend. Within hours of the murder, the man is brought in for questioning, and an eyewitness picks him out of a lineup. However, uh, he had an ironclad alibi. He had uh, in excess of uh, 12 witnesses who put him in a restaurant at a grill cooking. With the release of the boyfriend, Madzikane drew his own conclusion. It was a random assault, and that uh, this individual uh, probably had a criminal record. If Madzikane is right, and it was a random act of violence, then there's little hope of a quick conviction. Meanwhile, the forensics team scour Penny's car for clues. Although the technology was pretty basic back in the 70s, they uncover a wealth of evidence. There was a tissue box on the back seat, and there was a fingerprint on the tissue box. And then we found the handkerchief with the same blood on it, same type blood. Aside from the blood, there was Freon, which is used as a propellant in spray paint and auto body. And there was mechanics grease. Freon, spray paint, and grease. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure it out. This is someone who gets his hands dirty working with cars. Mazikane checks out hundreds of local mechanics, but he can't match the fingerprint. Overnight, New Haven becomes a ghost town. Women are afraid to go anywhere alone. Weeks turn into months. Live leads become dead ends. Mazikane is frustrated and getting desperate. He makes a decision that most people might consider highly unusual. He decides to bring a psychic on board. When you got to a point where an investigation becomes dead and you want to jumpstart it, uh, you certainly would revert to a psychic. Mazikane gets in touch with Mary Pascarella Downey, a psychic and time walker. She brings a new dimension to the investigation. For most people, the notion of time is just that, a notion, a means of measuring fragments of our lives. For Mary, time is personified, and she can talk to it. When I discuss time uh, as, as a time worker, um, time surrounds us, past, present, and future. You can't change time. You can move it around and play with it, but you can't change it. But the, the present past is something that's available. It's like a large library. Um, if I'm dealing with time, it's like you pick a string up and then you begin to wind it like a ball. And the more you wind it, the larger the ball gets and the more information you compile. 
Time is, is, is like a moving camera. It, it, it takes pictures and, and retains things. And if you listen very carefully, time, time is like a, a, a verbal library. It gives you information. It defines things for you. Somebody asked me once what my impression was of time. And my impression of time is it's like a large ocean with uh, lots of, of thought patterns that are, are boats floating in it. And if you really want to deal with it, you swim out to the boat, climb aboard, and gain whatever information you can get from that little boat. If I get an impression from time of a face, I'll draw a face. Mary's drawing is similar to an eyewitness description of the killer, but it's not enough to nail him. She does, however, provide some important but cryptic clues. I just knew blue was extremely important to the case because it kept repeating itself. It says blue is important. Blue is important. Blue. What, I, I said, what does blue tell me? Blue. Well, let's think about this. I'm talking to myself. The car was blue. The incident occurred on the 8th and 10th level. Is there any blue up there? No. What does blue tell me? Was he wearing blue clothes? Did he have blue shoes on or a blue hat? No. Uh, OK, so we'll file that. Blue. Sure, the car was blue, and Penny's dress was blue, but it doesn't identify the killer. I got the odor of oil, or like you would smell in a garage. So I tied that to the person and said to myself, oh, this must be somebody that's a, a mechanic. Amazingly, Mary had picked up on the mechanic connection. The fact that Mazakane had been pursuing the possibility that a mechanic was involved had never been released to the public. And then the psychic provided a third cryptic clue. Water kept repeating itself, and I thought to myself, well, this is New Haven. It's a harbor. You're surrounded by water. At that point, I thought, well, water's important to tell me that it happened here in New Haven. And I let it go at that. Another non-starter. Doesn't every psychic see water? I said, this is frustrating. She said, well, I can't tell you anything. I guess I was looking for some kind of an answer to, to, the, to the crime, to put me on, on... And she said, no, I, I don't do that. Mary wouldn't be able to provide the detective with the kind of answers that he was looking for, but she did have insight into the problems with the case. But I did say blood would tell, that uh, the case would not be solved for years and years and years because the person was somebody that would just slip very ordinary and slip right through the cracks. And so it would be years before, but don't give up because blood would tell. I had no idea what that sentence meant at that time. I said, do I have to wait for this guy to commit a crime? And then, and then we go back to work? And she said, no, it's not going to be like that. She said, it's going to be a long time from now. So I said, oh, that's, that's not very encouraging to myself, you know? No, I gotta, I've got to prove her wrong or discard all her information or comments at that point. It looked like the case would never be solved, but there was one man who was determined not to let that happen. Detective George Mezzacane was hunting down the brutal killer of Penny Sarah. When he reached a dead end, he sought the help of professional psychic Mary Pascarella Downey. Mary insisted that the killer would eventually be caught, but the visual clues she provided were vague. The color blue and a sense of water were not hard evidence. Certainly not something he'd want to share with his superiors. I never committed this to writing because it would look like nonsense. And then one time I mentioned something at, in the detective division to someone and the chief inspector said to me, uh, uh, you're not reading uh, tea leaves anymore, are you? He said, uh, I said, no. He said, well, when you get through with that, he says, I want you to go and go out and take care of something, get back to doing good old fashioned police work. Matsukane decided to ignore the ridicule of his superior and continue working with Mary for two reasons. Firstly, conventional police work had yielded no positive results. 
Secondly, he was under pressure from Penny's father, John. She said, I want to get more information on Penny. I want to hold one of her objects. Did you bring any with you? I said, no. She said, well, uh, I need some significant part of clothing, the dress she wore that day. I said, I'll get something. So I went back after we, this was a brief uh, conversation. And uh, I was interested, but I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't have anything to chew on, you know? It was like, uh, you know, like a light beer, I guess. Everything you wanted and less, you know? I guess they have to characterize it that way, you know? There was a lot uh, there, but... And uh, I wasn't surprised. I was interested. For their second meeting, Matsukain brought Penny's father along. John Sarah had campaigned to keep this case alive from day one. Every week, he placed ads in local papers in an attempt to find the killer. He did not want it put on the shelf and wait 20 years for someone to come in and confess to a crime. He wanted to know that there was somebody working on this case every day. And that was his mission, and he accomplished that. Matsukane also brought a favorite coat of Penny's. The process of psychic reading through an object is known as psychometry. When you walk into a house, you either get a good feeling or a bad feeling. When you meet somebody, you either like them or you're wary of them. That's your energy reaching out to protect you. And it's exactly the same as any viewer that's out there has had the deja vu, that's had met somebody and been cautious, that's gone into a house and couldn't wait to get out. I mean, it, it's, this is psychometry. That's the world of psychometry. It's energy speaking. She began to talk about Penny and uh, what kind of a woman she was and what she thought had happened and kind of recapped what she had told me. The only thing that we did get from that was that I knew very well that it was somebody that had never seen her before, had nothing to do with them, with her, and that it was just a chance occurrence. Wrong place, wrong time. Mazzucane's suspicions are confirmed. Right from the start, he also felt the killing was random. After the session, Mazzucane and Penny's father had their own meeting. I said, what do you think after we left? I said, did you, did, did you feel comfortable? Did you, did you, did you think she's a quack? Where did she get all this information? How did, uh, how did she? He says, I don't know. He said, but she's good. He said, I, I believe her. He said, uh, if, if she can help, I, I, I'd like her involved. So I said, OK. She had suggested that she wanted to go to the crime scene and get some impressions of the person who did this. So he was all for that. He said, sure. And uh, I thought it was a good idea. Uh, we had come this far. Why leave uh, that part uh, undone? It's been over a year since Penny Sarah was murdered. Conventional police work has produced nothing. Out of sheer desperation, Matsukane continues to put his faith in Mary. And this is actually where it happened? Yes, right in uh, this area here is where she bolted from the car. Can this odd couple manage to grasp some psychic evidence from the crime scene and not only capture a brutal killer, but bring some solace to a heartbroken father? Witnesses said he chased her up this way. She was looking around. She said, uh, she says, I've got a terrible headache. She says, I'm getting an awful headache on this side or I said to myself, what has that got to do with anything? Where's that gonna lead me? Why was she getting a headache in the area where this guy was standing, where he was observed? Is there a, is there a logical explanation for that? When we got to the garage, um, the, the perpetrator began to become more clear to me as far as, as, as as what he was like and who he was. So basically, I saw him in a uniform. Um, I smelled the gas. I knew that he worked with a garage. I saw him wiping his hands on an oily rag. And I saw a uniform with a name tag with the letter E on it. And I knew that he worked in a garage. He was probably a mechanic. He was thin. 
He was wiry, he weighed maybe 160, 65 pounds tops, and that he had the injury to his head. I mean, that's a lot to digest and sleep on. I mean, you'd, you'd be talking in your sleep if you got hit with all that at once. For Madza Kane, returning to the crime scene raises more questions than answers. My primary questions were what actually did happen and what really was in this man's mind at the time of this uh, murder. And that's what this uh, revisiting uh, stirs in me. While we were in the garage, one of the things that, that was, was you were very aware of is that you're dealing with a girl that was very lovely. Penny Sarah was like a, a little rainbow. She reminds me so much of one of my children. Uh, logical, reasonable, common sense, sweet and understanding. You could picture her fighting to stay alive. That was the one thing that really began to get to me is I knew she fought to stay alive. And that really disturbed me. And I wondered why hadn't anybody heard her, because I know she would have cried out. I don't want to make this sound like I had a religious experience. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I'm, I'm, it was just a feeling that I had. I felt that uh, she was getting information from a gift that she had. And I, I never felt that with another person in my life before, and I've worked with some psychics before, and I've worked with some after, and um, I never got that feeling, you know, that I was going to get help, or I was going to get that kind of, you know, it never happened again. From the very onset of getting the case, I knew that blue was extremely important. Blue, 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 kept repeating. And then when we, as we approached the garage, I knew that it, where we were going would be the blue floor. So as we entered the garage and George was driving up, I noted that there were numbers on the floor. So I thought I was wrong. Later on, I checked with one of the attendants and he did say that years ago, uh, they did color code the floors, but then they changed it to a, a numeric format. So and I was right. So, so she was so right. I was, so I was right, yeah. and then the, it was blue. Yeah. Oh, good. Another, another confirmation. I had the feeling that this woman knew something. And I honestly thought that she was going to tell me who did it. Go get this guy. Here's his name. I wrote it down in his address. It was scary in that someone could know that kind of information and not have enough to take you over the top. That was frustrating. Mary's visit to the parking garage had produced several new clues. However, every psychic has their limit. I'm not involved beyond the point of my first initial investigation. There are a lot of psychics that have the same philosophy that I have, that we are not going to solve a murder case. We are not police. We are going to be an informant, somebody that informs them of something that might be that they may have missed or not paid attention to. A good psychic will only do what they're asked to do and nothing more, and walk away. Detective Matsakane continues working on the Penny Sarah case. Years pass with no significant progress. Then, in 1979, Matsakane decides that he too has reached his limit. After 17 years with the New Haven Police Department, the detective retires. I just hit a stone wall, I think. I just hit the wall and uh... I was getting totally consumed with this. And Mary had given me all these leads, but I needed something to put everything together, and I just couldn't. I I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that it got to a point where I just, uh, uh, I didn't feel like I was being, I was useful anymore. With Mazza Kane out of the picture, one of Mary's predictions has already come true. Five years have passed since the murder, and the case still hasn't been solved. In fact, it would be another six years before there's a break in the case. A woman calls the police and claims that her husband threatened to do the same thing to her as he'd done to Penny Sarah. The man is arrested and charged with Penny's murder. Is this the man Mary Downey saw in her visions? Will John Sarah finally get justice? 
because although it's been 11 years, the statute of limitations doesn't apply to murder. After one of the largest homicide investigations in New Haven history, a suspect is about to go on trial for the murder of Penny Sarah. Before a word of evidence is heard, the retired detective who spent five years working the case has reached his own verdict. I just knew he was not guilty. We had already checked this guy out three or four years ago. He had an alibi, he was working that day. Mazakane was right. On the eve of the trial, the prosecutor made a startling announcement. The suspect's blood was type A. The blood found at the crime scene was type O. Case dismissed. The man was fully exonerated, but the damage was done. His life would never be the same. It's only in movies the wrongly accused walk away smiling. Once again, the Penny Sarah case goes cold. Years pass. Fortunately for this case and many others, in the early 90s, the landscape of police work in America would change forever with the creation of a computerized fingerprint database. One of the first prints uploaded onto the new system is from the box of tissues found in Penny Sarah's car. Because of the backlog with the new system, it took three years to find a match. The guy's name, Grant. First name, Edward. And I saw a uniform with a name tag with the letter E on it. The letter E for Edward, exactly as Mary predicted. And at one point, Grant had fixed cars for a living, another prediction of Mary's that proved absolutely accurate. Grant had been arrested in 1994 on a domestic violence rap. He had no prior convictions. The person was somebody that would just slip very ordinary and slip right through the cracks. Once again, Mary was spot on. For all intents and purposes, Grant was a clean, living, nondescript citizen. Don't give up because blood would tell. Mary Downey couldn't possibly have known what blood would tell meant, because when she predicted it more than 20 years ago, forensic DNA technology didn't exist. And it transpired that on the day of the murder, Grant had been to the nearby Veterans Administration Hospital to receive treatment for an old head injury. This guy's got three plates in his head. 30 years later, you find she was getting his headache. She was telling me this uh, almost 30 years earlier. All of psychic Mary Downey's predictions had hit the mark. But what about the vision of water? The one clue both Matsukane and Mary dismissed. It turns out Grant lived in the nearby town of Waterbury. As for Grant, the fingerprint match allowed police to get a blood sample so that his DNA could be compared to blood found at the crime scene. It, too, was a positive match. I just uh, couldn't believe it, but I could believe it. And uh, I knew it was him. On Thursday, June 24th, 1999, almost 26 years after the crime was committed, Edward R. Grant was arrested for the murder of Penny Sarah. In September 2002, he was sentenced to serve 20 years in prison. He won't be eligible for parole until he's 80 years old. Up to the end, Grant maintained his innocence, so we may never know why Penny Sarah was murdered. The tragic irony of this story is that Penny's father, John Sarah, a man who had devoted more than 20 years of his life trying to help bring the killer to justice, died just eight months before Grant was caught. I could see John going to heaven and saying to God, now listen, God, <laughs> it's been all these years, and Mary said the wisdom was going to be solved, so I want it solved. And God said, okay, we'll take care of it. And that's what happened. They say truth is stranger than fiction, and in this case, the truth was very, very strange. December 1998, Lindsay Kwai vanishes on Christmas Day. A police missing persons inquiry fails and a family is torn apart. But a visitor from beyond the grave appears to a psychic in a nightmarish vision. She told me she'd been carnaged and mangled. She was trying to tell us that she'd been brutally murdered. Then she flashed 
the railway line. I could see, I could see the railway track, and I feel is that's where she was telling me is this was where she had been killed. And it was for me to go and help him. Is Lindsay missing, or is she dead? And can a psychic discover the truth behind her disappearance? Southport, northwest England, deserted now, but every summer this seaside town attracts millions of visitors. Most come to breathe in the sea air, stretch out on the miles of empty beaches, and enjoy the thrills of the roller coaster. But this man is no tourist. He is psychic Joe Power, and he's been drawn here by a missing girl and a nightmare he will never forget. The story starts here in December 1998. Lindsay Kwai is a 21-year-old wife and mother of two small children. Lindsay was a very kind person, do anything for anybody, good mother. The Kwais are just an average family preparing for the holidays, but on Christmas Day 1998, their lives change forever when Lindsay mysteriously vanishes. Days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and still nobody hears from Lindsay. Her family begin to suspect that something is very wrong. Well, you know, anyone goes missing in your family, it's, it's, it's just undescribable, the feelings you get. Everyone was worrying, and our brains were going swirling. We weren't sleeping, we weren't eating. It was just a great worry. In February, Southport police take a statement from Lindsay's distraught husband, Mitchell. He said that she'd gone out drinking with her friends and that she'd stayed out all night and he'd been left alone with the two children in the house and had woken with them on his own on Christmas Day and went on to say that um, <clears throat> Lindsay had arrived later on the Christmas morning, still under the influence of drink, uh, went into a shower, didn't say anything, got a few clothes together and then left without saying anything to the children. Sometime in the January, he'd seen her in a vehicle with a guy who he didn't know um, at a junction in Southport somewhere, and he presumed that she'd just started a new life. Since then, nobody has seen or heard from Lindsay. Police class her as a missing person, and working with her husband, Mitchell, start a high-profile nationwide appeal for her return. We had a press conference, which he attended, and uh, he reiterated the story that he'd given to the police. When she came in in the morning, she was out of her face. Um, she came in at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, she went straight up to bed, and I got the kids up then, opened the presents up. She showed no kind of interest in the kids on Christmas Day. We'd had trouble in our relationship, and uh, we decided to separate before Christmas. Um, but we were going to stay together through Christmas. I thought I was going to leave after New Year, but she's, she's up and left before then. Lindsay's father, Peter Wilson, makes an appeal to his daughter. I just say, you know, if Lindsay's watching this, uh, no one's blaming her what she's, for what she's done, you know, leaving the children. And we'd like to contact the police as soon as possible. Psychic Joe Power has been following the case in the press, but late one night in February, he has a nightmare that he thinks is a message from the spirit world. I'd gone to sleep, it was like any ordinary night. During my sleep, I heard a phone ring and two people appeared to me. Joe recognizes the woman from the newspapers as housewife Lindsay Kwai, but police think she is a missing person. Joe claims that the spirit of Lindsay is trying to tell him she's been murdered, who her killer is, and where to find her body. Lindsay Kwai told me she had been carnage and mangled. Joe's vision is incredibly violent and shocks him to this day. And then she told me for the police to search the railway and also, as well, the police must search the fairgrounds. But why did Lindsay want these two areas searched? As the images intensify, Joe receives more information. I heard McDowell's, and I actually seen McDowell's, so I was, I was hearing it and I was seeing it. And I also um, heard her say tractors. Joe is confused and distressed by his vision. He turns to friend, retired police support worker, Frida Valentine, for advice. He started telling me that he'd been visited by Lindsay Kwai in a dream, and she said, please help me. I am desperate for some 
um, somebody to recognize that I have been murdered. Um, I am not a missing person. Frida is shocked by what Joe tells her. I think he really believed that she had been cut up with him saying about the mangled carnage. It more or less looked as though they couldn't see or recognize any parts of the body. Joe also tells Frida where he thinks Lindsay might be buried. He told me that um, he'd been shown the railway track and also the fairground in Southport. I suggested to uh, Joe that he go to the police and give all this information. Reluctantly, Joe follows Frida's advice. I was absolutely terrified um, going into a police station. I thought they would think I was the murderer going in with so much detailed and accurate information. But no detectives from the missing persons inquiry team is available, so Joe gives a full statement to another officer. And she reassured me that that information would be passed on to the officers in charge. If information comes in from a psychic or a medium that we feel can be corroborated or will send us in a certain direction, then my view is that we will always utilize that if it helps us. But the problem with that is that quite often it's not supported by any uh, tangible evidence. Joe never hears back from the police regarding his statement. As far as they're concerned, this is still a missing persons case. Well, it was very frustrating to me because at that time I knew this was a murder case and not a missing persons. Joe is determined to discover more about Lindsay Kwai's mysterious disappearance. Has she been killed? Was she buried in the fairground or the railway? And could Joe convince the police Lindsay is not a missing person and a killer is walking free? A young mother, Lindsay Kwai, has gone missing. Police have no clue to her whereabouts. Her husband has appealed for her safe return, but in a terrifying vision, psychic Joe Power sees a woman being killed and dismembered. Is this Lindsay? Should police be hunting a murderer? Joe is determined to find out. I felt I had to investigate this case myself because the police were not listening, and I felt I had a sense of duty to get this young lady's remains found. Joe drives to Southport. He has no map and he doesn't know the area. All he has is his confusing list of locations from Lindsay. The railway, the fairground, McDowell's and a tractor yard. After hours in the car, Joe is tired and lost. He's convinced his psychic connection to Lindsay has failed until he reaches a certain road completely by chance. It was just around this part here that I heard a voice crystal clear and a sudden noise shouted, stop. And I turned to the right, pulled up the car, and for no apparent reason at all is that the car horn started to go off. I got out of the car, pulled the bonnet, eventually it went off. And I got back in the car and I decided with the car horn going off, that I'd get away from the area because of the neighbors and the sound. And I felt really quite frightened at that stage. And I drove around on the next street. But just before I'd actually got to the bottom of the road, there was a place called McDowell's. That was on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side was another place full of tractors. That's when it all sunk into me, that this is where she had actually sent me. Both the tractor yard and McDowell's are on Stamford Road, the very road where Lindsay lived with husband Mitchell and her two children. Joe is now convinced that the woman who appeared to him was Lindsay Kwai. But why is she drawing him here? After I left the area, I felt shocked, I felt disturbed, but I also felt, it's strange to say this, is reassurance in the images that I had actually received. Once again, Joe decides to contact the police. This time, he writes a letter to the head of the missing person investigation, Bob Marsden. I wrote to Bob Marsden and told him that I was no ordinary person. I was doing this because this young lady had appeared to me, and this case needs to be looked at in more detail. Joe receives this receipt for his letter, but the police do not call. I believe Joe was getting very, very frustrated because he'd informed all the police and yet they still believed that she was actually missing. Sometime after Joe's letter arrived at Southport Police Headquarters, a review of the missing person's inquiry is ordered. 
Detective Superintendent Jeff Sloan is brought in to re-examine all the evidence. Immediately, his instincts as a police officer tell him something is not right. There was a lot of circumstantial evidence which tended towards the fact that um, Lindsay was not alive. We, we couldn't establish any proof of life. Lindsay hasn't used her bank account since before Christmas. She hasn't applied for income support or housing benefit. Vital medical appointments have been missed, and she has had no contact with her family, not the actions of either a runaway or a loving mother. When I read through the documents and I read through the lifestyle and some of the issues that um, emanated from that missing from home inquiry, I formed the opinion quite quickly that um, this actually should be a murder inquiry. I felt that Lindsay had been murdered. Joe Power is no longer alone in his belief that Lindsay has been killed. It's very frustrating, you know, knowing that this young lady had been cornered to the mangles and you have to sit there and wait for her to be found. Detective Superintendent Jeff Sloan is placed in charge of the new murder inquiry, but this isn't going to be an easy case to crack. It's very frustrating not to have a body because um, when you have a body, that's where your lines of inquiry start to develop. All we had was 22 Stamford Road, which was Lindsay's home address, where she'd lived with Mitchell. Well, the very first thing that we do is to go back and fully search the house again and the, the gardens and the area surround, immediately surrounding the house. Using the house as their starting point, the police begin one of the largest searches ever conducted in mainland England. And we actually used officers from the Royal Air Force, the JARIC, which is a reconnaissance organisation, who flew over um, and could detect any recently disturbed ground. And if they highlighted any areas, then we would send a specialist search team to go and excavate. It's an agonising time for Lindsay's family. We're by the phone 24-7, and sometimes we get false information where the bones have been found at one time. And uh, we were given the information, then we found out it was a pig, a dead pig. And then when you heard about a body being found and this, that and the other, one was found in the River Ribble, I think, you wondered if that was Lindsay. It's never ending. But the police failed to find any evidence of Lindsay. I was concerned that we hadn't found a body and I was at a loss as to where we would look to next and, and took the decision that we wouldn't undertake any more searches or digging until it was based on intelligence that we had through. But it was, was frustrating for me. The police are forced to suspend all searches, but Lindsay's parents refuse to give up hope. They spend every waking moment looking for their daughter. Well, we searched in canals, rivers, we got stung by bees, hornets, you name it. But, uh, you know, I used to be up to my neck sometimes in freezing cold water. We couldn't stop. It was just our way of contributing towards finding Lindsay. With the police search on hold and no new information coming forward, it looks as if Lindsay's body may never be found and the case remain unsolved. But psychic Joe Power believes this is something the spirit world would never allow. Joe thinks Lindsay's spirit is unable to rest, as once again she appears to him with a message from beyond the grave. The second time Lindsay appeared to me was at my home address, and she came to me and told me that the police were not listening to the information that I had previously provided to them. Joe's first vision led him to Lindsay's house. Now he returns to Southport to search the fairground and railway track. He has a feeling that these areas are in some way connected to her disappearance. He starts at the railway track. Joe doesn't know what he should be looking for. He's hoping his psychic powers will be his guide. When I walked along this particular part of the railway line, my hair stood up on my hand and I heard a voice I believe that was Lindsay telling me is that she was in this location. But if Lindsay is buried at the railway, why does Joe want the police to search the fairground as well? It was quite clear to me is that this young lady's remains were in two separate locations. But Joe Power fails to find any evidence that Lindsay is in this location. For Detective Superintendent Sloan, the case is equally baffling with no new leads coming in. He decides to re-examine the original witness testimonies. He wants to build a picture of Lindsay's last known movements. We believe Lindsay had been shopping on the 15th of December and had actually made a call to the benefits agency and she made an inquiry about a missing cheque 
which should have been issued in the November. Uh, as a result of that conversation, she was sent out a disclaimer form, uh, which was never ever received and never ever recovered by the police. Uh, it was after that phone call, basically, that uh, Lindsay ceased to exist. Detective Superintendent Sloan discovers that the only person who claims to have seen Lindsay alive after December 16th was her husband, Mitchell Kwai. He told police she left him and abandoned her children on Christmas Day. Detective Superintendent Sloan is suspicious. He has a feeling Mitchell's statement doesn't ring true. It doesn't fit with the profile he has built of Lindsay. Given the background of Lindsay, what, what her upbringing was, the way she was uh, interacted with her children, that there was no way um, she would have walked out on her children on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Police take a closer look at Lindsay and Mitchell's relationship. Mitchell was very violent towards Lindsay over a number of years, and ultimately she did try to um, institute divorce proceedings from him. But the, the issue was then that she'd always accepted Mitchell back and they'd always be reconciled. Could Mitchell really be her killer? Was this why Lindsay's spirit led Joe to her road? Was she trying to tell him that this was the murder scene? It's been nine months since Lindsay Kwai disappeared in Southport, Northwest England. Detective Superintendent Jeff Sloan believes that Lindsay has been murdered, just as psychic Joe Power said over seven months earlier. Joe's nightmarish vision had started a psychic investigation that took him to Southport Fairground, the railway track, and Lindsay's own home. But what significance did these locations have? All is to be revealed as police close in on their prime suspect, Lindsay's husband, Mitchell Kwai. Well, Mitchell portrayed an image of he was the abandoned father, the abandoned hu husband, and that. Um, Sadly for us, he, he was very plausible in front of the media. Uh, he was very confident, overconfident sometimes. He seemed to be reaching out to the community and a lot of people seemed to be believing him and formed the opinion that perhaps the police were just picking him out because he seemed the obvious uh, candidate for, for a suspect. In June 2000, Detective Superintendent Jeff Sloan trusts his instincts and arrests Mitchell Kwai on suspicion of murdering his 21-year-old wife, Lindsay. Well, Mitchell was an egotist, and I actually felt that he formed the opinion that he could get away with this because of the time element and the fact that um, the media had shown such an interest in him and various members of the community were sympathetic to him. But despite hours of questioning, Mitchell refuses to crack. Detective Superintendent Sloan is convinced that he has his man, but he doesn't have enough evidence to press charges. It looks like Mitchell is about to walk. Basically stuck to his story, um, but when we listened to the interviews, his responses and his replies, I got from the psychologist that we were starting really to get to him and he was becoming quite low and down in this. And I think the telling point came when I gave instructions within his hearing that his father was to be charged and so was his brother. Phone records show that at key points in the investigation, Mitchell made an unusually large number of calls to his brother Elliot and his father. This was totally out of character, and Detective Superintendent Sloan thought it pointed to their involvement. The arrest of Elliot and the subsequent arrest of Mitchell's father had quite a, a pronounced impact on Mitchell because I think he felt that um, he'd actually succeeded in convincing uh, members of the public, the press, and to a certain degree the police, that uh, he was right and that, that Lindsay had just disappeared. He thought it would go away. And I, I got the impression that when he realised that we did mean business and that they too had been arrested, that reality started to creep in and the realisation was that he wasn't going to get away with it. I made the decision that I was going to charge Mitchell with murder. And within a very, very short space of time, I was contacted on my mobile to tell me that Mitchell had actually admitted that he had in fact killed Lindsay. Over a year after Lindsay Kwai first went missing, the truth surrounding her disappearance is finally uncovered. The last few hours of Lindsay's life all centered around the check that had gone missing in November. Mitchell, at some stage, um, tried to encash that check. There's a row developed over that, and he's lost his control, and he strangled her. As Mitchell's confession continues, the true horrific nature of the crime is revealed. 
and that's when he recruited Elliot to come in and to help him to dispose of the body. And that's when he, he decided that um, he and Elliot would cut the body up in the bath with the children asleep in bed in the next room, which I thought, thought was horrific. The images of violence in Joe's dream were now explained. Lindsay was dismembered, just as Joe had said. And the scene of the crime? Lindsay's house on Stamford Road, the very place Joe had been led to 12 months earlier. How did he know these facts? I knew 100% I'd been right all the time. It was a very emotional case and a very upsetting case. Mitchell Kwai leads police officers to the locations where he buried his wife's remains. Lindsay's torso was found near to the Pleasureland theme park at Southport behind a go-kart uh, racing track where Mitchell used to work. We found Lindsay's legs on the railway embankment, which was near to one of the first places they, they resided together. Joe had asked for these locations to be searched over 12 months earlier. I, I knew straight away. It, it didn't come as a surprise for me. You, what you've got to remember is how powerful these images were she had shown to me. She'd already shown me the fairground. She'd shown me the railway. But unfortunately for Joe, at that time, he was working alone. He never did receive the call to help the police. But Joe believes there is one person who recognizes the part he played in this case. Lindsay briefly appeared to me after her remains were actually found, and I heard her say thank you, and there was no more contact from this young lady. On January 16, 2001, Mitchell Kwai is sentenced. Mitchell was sentenced to a mandatory life uh, term of imprisonment um, with a tariff of 18 years because of the severity of the way he disposed of his wife, Lindsay. Elliot Kwai receives seven years for his part in the gruesome murder. Mitchell's father is released without charge. This case was extremely difficult to crack, um, not least because of the way that she was um, murdered, the way she was disposed of, and the way that he behaved after the murder, actually actively seeking the press and seeking public opinion on his side and sympathy. Detective Superintendent Sloan receives a special commendation for the integral part he played in the capture and conviction of this most devious of killers. Joe Power's personal investigation is as yet unrecognized. When the killers were caught, I was very satisfied that I'd done my job. All the detail and all the information that had been provided made me feel very, very satisfied, not only just for me, but for, the, for Lindsay Quay's parents as well. It was a very emotional case and a very upsetting case. To lose Lindsay that way has affected everybody, the whole family. Me included, never going to be the same again. Still suffering now, we'll just be suffering until the day we die. Peter, my eldest son, uh, hung himself in the loft at my house. Could never get over the fact of what they did to Lindsay after they'd murdered her. That's what led to his suicide. Two years after her vicious murder, Lindsay is finally able to rest in peace. But she leaves behind a family torn apart by tragedy. Mitchell's taken my daughter. He's taken Robin and, and Jack's mother. He's taken my son, Peter, because I blame him for that as well. He's taken a lot of the family, which we'll never forgive him for. Pub landlord Mick Hughes is ferociously attacked in the living quarters above his bar. He's battered and beaten over the head and left bleeding to die. After hundreds of hours of investigation, the police are baffled. They just don't have enough evidence to make an arrest. Uh, there was a feeling of, of a marathon about that inquiry. Local psychic Angela McGee visits the scene of the crime. I could see a vision of Mick's body lying under the window. I actually could see his injuries. Her spirit allies show her the terrible truth. I got this awful shudder through me. And I realised then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Can Angela's supernatural visions help bring the brutal killer to justice?
Sunday, April 27, 2003. Police race towards the quiet village of Pelsall near Birmingham, towards the Royal Oak Pub. Staff arriving for work have found the body of the landlord, Mick Hughes, brutally bludgeoned to death. Detective Inspector Ian Bamber and Detective Constable Mike Crump have the job of catching the killer. Mick's body was found in his private bedroom area that was on the first floor of the pub. He had sustained uh, serious head injuries consistent with him being struck uh, with an object. The attack had been ferocious, uh, sustained, uh, and really malicious. Um, if offenders had meant to incapacitate him, uh, to render him unconscious or knock him out, you could have easily done that with one or two blows. But no, they hit him again and again and again. The bedroom upstairs where Mick slept was ransacked. All the early indications suggested uh, was that it had been a burglary that had gone drastically wrong. Michael Hughes was a family man, just two months away from his 60th birthday. His daughter, Sharon, is devastated by the news. You see it on TV, but until you've actually lived it, you can't describe how it destroys you as a person and as a family. You really can't. They asked me and my sister if we could go down to the morgue and identify my dad's body. It was the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> Sharon and her family are desperate for justice. But despite weeks of intensive forensic investigation and hundreds of interviews with local people, the police cannot find any conclusive evidence. A neighboring publican decides to call in psychic medium Angela McGee. I had a phone call from a friend, um, and she asked me to go down uh, to help with the local murder. Um, and my reaction was, what if they don't believe, you know? Um, I'm not going to go down there and look stupid. I said, I'll wait till I get a message through spirit. I'll wait till the right moment. Within days, that moment comes. Well, I had a message from my own father in spirit. It was him that actually told me to go. He said, what about this murder? What about this murder? And then I knew I had to go. I believe that uh, mediumship, you are an instrument of the spirit world. It's not voluntary. You just do what you have to do. Angela drives to the Royal Oak pub. She's never been here before and knows nothing about the murder. But that is about to change. I sat there in meditation for a little while, said my prayers and put my hands up and said, Dear God, what have I got to tell these people? With that, I had a vision. I saw three men climbing up a black fire escape staircase, over the roof, over the railings, and in through the French windows. And I thought to myself, that is where they've got in this building. Emboldened by her vision, Angela decides to go in. She is greeted by Beryl Chapman, former partner of Mick Hughes, who is looking after the Royal Oak. Beryl shows Angela to the living quarters of the pub. She stands in the hall. Then suddenly she is shown a second vision. I could see bodies struggling, as if there was a real push-pull-you type thing going on, and there was blood. It was just a flash, literally a flash of vision. Angela goes to the bedroom where Mick met his grisly fate. As she moves into the room, Spirit sends her another terrifying glimpse of the past. Again, another flash of vision. You could see a vision of Mick's body lying under the window. But you could see his injuries in his head and down the one side. Now Angela sees something wonderful. And all of a sudden, I saw Mick in my mind's eye. The spirit of the dead publican appears standing before her. And he was making a point of a thick gold chain bracelet which was holding up. Mick tells Angela that his killer also stole his bracelet. Mick said, 
that he knew that person, he had drunk with that person, he had fished with that person, he knew that person very, very well. I felt totally aghast. I just thought, take a deep breath here, I can't believe what I've just heard. It's an astonishing revelation. But before Angela can react, she has another vision. Three men running away. It's almost as if they've rushed past me, and if I could feel their panic, but one of them had something the size of a shoebox with him. That's all I saw. Angela has never experienced such an incredible barrage of visions, but as she leaves the pub, she has the most terrifying insight of all. As I walked through the pub, I glanced at the bar, and there behind the bar was a young man pulling pints. I got this awful shudder through me, complete coldness. I just felt that there was complete emptiness there, as if he'd got no soul. And I realised then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Not waiting to see his face, Angela runs from the pub. If she's correct, the killer is still right under the noses of the police. Landlord Mick Hughes has been brutally murdered above his pub, the Royal Oak, by person or persons unknown. Psychic Angela McGee has visited the scene of the crime. Her spirit allies sent her an astonishing series of visions containing clues about the murder. I saw the vision of three men going up to the Bucks Fire Escape staircase. I then saw Mick's body. I saw Mick himself. I saw three men leaving with something the size of a shoebox. I glanced at the bar and I realised then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Despite months of painstaking investigation, the police still don't have enough solid evidence to make an arrest. And when, when there was a feeling of, of a marathon about, about that inquiry. Uh, there was a, a, a great deal of information coming in that was, that was being looked at. Um, but. Uh, little that was that was helping us to get to to the bottom of what had actually happened the police are running out of options when fate leads them to angela in the course of uh, my inquiries i met a woman who had met angela mcgee at one of her psychic uh, meetings and uh, this woman uh, stated that angela had discussed the the murder with her we decided that whilst um, the evidential opportunities might be limited. It would really be uh, foolhardy and a bit ignorant not to at least um, go and speak to Angela. Mike Crump and a colleague go to Angela's house to interview her. She invited us in. She made us a, a, a cup of tea, uh, and we spoke to, to Angela about, uh, about what she knew. Angela tells the police about her vision on the fire escape and of the body in the bedroom. She had no way of knowing these things, but her account matches closely what police found in forensic examination. I was um, startled and sceptical, um, equally curious and intrigued. Now she really begins to surprise the police. She claimed that uh, the three men had been involved in the murder and that one of those men uh, had known uh, Michael Hughes. It sounds incredible but Angela's information fits with a number of theories the police are working on. To put numbers on offenders uh, raised some eyebrows, but from analysing the scene and trying to generate some hypotheses around what had happened, I think we were all fairly comfortable that it was more than one. She'd had a vision of them running away, one of them uh, carrying a shoebox-shaped object. The police know what Angela does not, that a safe the size of a shoebox was taken from the pub. We clearly knew that the safe had been ripped from its housing, so to hear Angela describe a boxed-shaped object being carried by, by a man was uh, fascinating. Angela's visions confirm facts the police already know or things they suspect. Her account fitted in on a number of features with the hypotheses that we were running on. The difficulty for us was trying to match any evidential facts that we knew about with Angela's vision. At the time of speaking to Angela, uh, I was a little cynical and sceptical about the information she was providing. 
but in the fullness of time it was quite surprising how accurate uh, some of the information she provided turned out to be. Angela has given the police fresh clues, but for now they don't know what to make of them. The lead officer tries to reassure Mick's grieving family. He'd come out and he'd explain there is things happening and we are working, but obviously we can't tell you everything in case it leaks out or in case it's wrong information we're receiving. He said, but trust me, we will sort this out and we will come one day with the answers for you. For the police, the pressure is on. Then Angela McGee has another startling revelation. I woke up the one morning, as I do sometimes, with messages. What I kept getting in my mind was a dolphin, block switch, dolphin, block switch. Angela phones a friend to tell her about the message. I was telling her about, I'm sure this is to do with the murder. I was getting the dolphin, block switch, a dolphin, block switch. And she said, there's a dolphin pub. I wanted to uh, relay that information to Mike Crump, so I gave him a call. Operation Greenside, DC Crump speaking, how can I help you? And I told him about the dolphin and, and block switch and that something would happen in three days. All of a sudden, I get a name. Yeah, OK, let's move, just get a, a pad and I'll just write it down. I felt it was more like a nickname of either Daz or Gaz. And I felt that was also associated with murder. Angela's information is relayed to the incident room, but for now, it's useless. Then, the police make a key discovery. They find the missing safe in a canal. This is the canal at Slacky Lane, uh, from where we recovered the safe that was from the Royal Oak pub. It was a breakthrough. Uh, it is important that uh, we recover uh, physical evidence, uh, such as the safe. Suddenly, Angela's message about the dolphin becomes clear and the Dolphin Public House is uh, situated just at the top of the road, um, about 150 yards away from the spot where I'm standing now. There is no earthly way that Angela could have known this. At the time that Angela uh, spoke to us about the Dolphin Public House, there was no obvious connection between that pub uh, and our investigation. It hadn't featured at all. At the very least, it was uh, interesting. Police are left wondering about Angela's message of the nickname. The, the difficulty for us, uh, where, where do you put Angela? What do you do with what Angela can tell you? And, and the problem is that you can't use it, can you? You can't ask Angela to step into a Crown Court witness box and on oath say, I'm a medium and I know what happened. It's completely inadmissible. To convict, they still need more concrete evidence. Then, exactly six months after the murder, the Royal Oak pub is burgled again. This time, police get the lead they've been waiting for. Bizarrely, um, on the exact six-month anniversary of Mick's death at the pub, the pub was broken into again in very chillingly similar circumstances. This time, eyewitnesses recognise the thief. Part-time bartender Gavin Chapman, son of Beryl Chapman, Mick Hughes' partner at the Royal Oak. Gavin Chapman uh, had a severe uh, drug problem. Uh, we believed he, he was uh, addicted to, uh, to heroin and possibly crack cocaine. Michael Hughes uh, was always quite suspicious that, that Gavin was taking money from him in various forms in order to fund his, his drug addiction. The police had always suspected Gavin Chapman might be involved in the murder, but he has an alibi with two other men, Stephen Lockley and Lee Worgan. We had evidence that, that cast doubt on their movements uh, in terms of the accounts that they had given. Um, but as far as, uh, as convicting them for a murder was concerned, we had very little. Now the police take a gamble. They bring all three men in for questioning. One by one, the men are interrogated and their stories scrutinised. In the initial stages, they, they, they stuck by their, their witness statements. I think they thought that if they maintained their original pack of lies, that um, they would walk. I'm, I'm sure that they were, they were that blasé and confident that they thought that they could, they could just bluff it out. Relatively quickly into the, uh, the interview process, one of them changed the story. And they began to um, point the finger at each other. The men confessed to burgling the Royal Oak on the night of the murder. 
they accuse each other of being the killer. Police decide to charge them all with murder as a joint enterprise. It's a bold strategy. There was a concern that was at the back of my mind that uh, around that joint enterprise argument, the jury wouldn't be able to clearly identify in their own minds who it was that struck the fatal blows. Uh, we felt that we had a very good and a very strong case, uh, but uh, you are in the, in the hands of the, the jury. Y you're hopeful. Uh, but you've always just, you know, you're crossing two fingers and hoping for the best. The trial is set for October 2004 in Birmingham, with three men charged, at least one of whom knew Mick and worked behind the bar. Everything that Angela told the police seems to be coming true. Gavin Chapman, Lee Worgan, and Stephen Lockley are set to be tried for Mick Hughes' murder. Waiting for the result, Angela goes on with her normal work as a medium. It was a few months um, later, uh, after I had my, my visit to the, to the Royal Oak, that I had a phone call. Carol Hall has lost her mother and wants a medium to contact her in spirit. I had, had no previous knowledge of Angela before this, before this phone number was handed to me. In fact, she was one of about four numbers that were handed to me. And the reason I picked Angela was because she was the, the one more local, because I didn't know if, they had a, if there was a radius to how far they'd travel. And, like, the address was pretty local, so I thought um, I'd go for Angela. Angela visits Carol one evening at her home. Angela sat uh, in the bedroom and I sat on the chair, more or less opposite to her. The spirit of a mother came through, and I felt that her mother's energy was all around the bedroom where we were. And I told Carol that her mother was with her son in spirit. Got to talking about it, and then they just said, which was the devastating bit, it was Michael. And that was when I just went to pieces, um, and I says, that was my brother. And she said, your mum's telling me she called him Michael, everybody else called him Mick, which was spot on. And all of a sudden, flash of the Royal Oak and a flash of Mick in my mind and I said it's Mick from the Royal Oak murder. The look on Angela's face it couldn't be captured on tape when she suddenly realised who she was talking about. She said he keeps telling me I've been there, I've been there and he says can I say, can I ask is it the pub in Pelsall and I says yeah. It's an amazing revelation. Angela didn't know it, but Carol Hall is Mick Hughes' sister. Mick's spirit has sought her out again. I could hear Mick say that he would see justice, and he would see justice three times. All I heard was justice, justice, justice. And then I says to Carol, I can see, I can see the family with their hands up in the air in triumph. And he also said something about Stafford and time which I had to reel out, which didn't make sense to me at the time. With the trial hanging in the balance, Angela's message gives comfort to Carol. With my brother coming through by Angela and saying that justice will be done, she was so right with Mum. I wanted this to be so right as well. But until the jury gives their verdict, the family can only hope that Angela's telling the truth. Just days before the trial is due to start in Birmingham, part of Mick's message becomes clear. Another case has overrun. The trial is moved to Stafford Crown Court. The court case, up until the Friday prior to the Monday's date for the court case, was going to be Birmingham. Then it was going to be Wolverhampton. And on the Monday, we had to go to Stafford, which was uncanny, very uncanny, because we weren't aware of that. Nobody was. For police and the family, it's a tense time. You've always got that element of doubt in the back of your mind and you're worried about how the jury will perceive the evidence that you, that you feel is very strong and how your witnesses will come across as well. The trial runs for three long weeks. I was struck by how appallingly badly uh, the three male defendants uh, conducted themselves throughout the whole trial. 
Uh, they sat at the back of the court uh, and grinned, chuckled to each other, uh, made smug comments about some of the witnesses that appeared uh, in the witness box. And when they, were, when they were ultimately asked to give evidence, they made the worst job of it I've ever seen in my life. They were absolutely appalling. Um, they were flippant, clearly telling lies. Chapman was asked whether he wanted to take the, the oath and his very first words to the jury were, whatever. Um, he, he, he did himself no favours. To hear people read it out as to the horrific injuries and how they occurred and how many times they hit my dad, um, that was really hard and at one stage my mum and my two brothers had to leave because they couldn't cope. Because to everybody else it's a story, to us it was our dad. <laughs> Finally, the moment of truth arrives. When the jury went out, uh, the, the courtroom is uh, charged with emotion. It's all right, you're just sitting there thinking, please, God, let him say guilty. The three men are found guilty. As Angela predicted, justice has been done three times. Each of the three men were convicted of uh, the murder uh, of, of Michael Hughes. Uh, they were also uh, convicted of, uh, of burglary and attempting to pervert the, the course of justice in terms of having a lie to us in, in the form of their witness statements. It was just unreal. It was, it was a dream come true. <sighs> As the family leave court, a photographer is waiting. He said, well, for the picture, you're going to have to punch the air and smile. In a flash, Angela's last vision becomes reality. But when I saw them, the hands go up, and I thought, yeah, that's completed the picture now. Angela's messages to the police and the family seem to have proved uncannily accurate. On speaking to Angela initially, I, I was quite cynical and, and sceptical about the nature of the information she provided. But in the fullness of time, aspects of it uh, turned out to be uh, quite accurate. Whilst it was always of, of limited uh, value to us as, as, as police officers, uh, this was uh, nevertheless uh, surprising. Stepping outside the police officer function and thinking about, about uh, myself as a person and, and, and Carol and Sharon spending some time with Angela, if I found myself in the same circumstances and I saw that olive branch of hope, would I reach out for it? Yeah, I probably would. It's been an incredible experience for Angela. I feel I've done my job's worth. I know that I work for the God Energy Force and the God Energy Spirit, um, and I'm just an instrument. But to me, it's like a, a pat on the back, I think. It was just a nice pat on the back. A loved husband and father goes missing. His wife is frantic to find him. I gotta get to him, we gotta find him. A psychic finds herself as a go-between, relaying clues she believes come from the man who's gone missing. It's Pickle, it's Pickle. Will this clue help police solve the mysterious disappearance? I could see the sincerity in her face. She believed what she was telling me. He wants to be found. March 1st, 1997, in the small town of Sharpsville, Pennsylvania, local chef Daryl Cozart headed out on Saturday night after work. He hasn't returned home to his wife Jeanette and their two small children. She knows something's not right. He told me he was going to go to see some friends at a bar, which was very unusual for him. Daryl didn't usually go hang out with friends. He was a really family man. On Sunday, when Daryl still hasn't returned home, Jeanette Cozart reports him missing to the police. To them, it's just a missing person case. It's not uncommon for a spouse to report somebody missing who maybe run off with some friends to get away for a few days. I knew something had to have happened to him for, not, for him not to contact me and not to 
let, let us know he's okay. We usually within 48 hours, the person appears back at home and maybe has to eat a little crow or has some patching up to do at home, but they always come back. They pretty much just told me, don't worry. And he's probably just on a drinking binge. And I'm like, no, this is not my husband. He didn't do those kind of things. He went to work, he came home. This is not what he did. Police weren't aware of any uh, problems at home or what would make him run off. They told me that um, it would be 72 hours, of course, before they could list him as a missing persons. And that's when we kind of took matters into our own hands and started making flyers up because we were frustrated. I just thought, well, maybe he's hurt. I got to get to him. We got to find him. Jeanette's mother drops off some missing person flyers at the newsstand owned by psychic Mary Ellen Rodriguez. Her son-in-law, Daryl Cozart, has been missing now for two days. She handed me the missing persons paper. When I touched it, it seemed like the energy of Daryl all of a sudden, it opened something up. And there was Daryl standing next to her. Here was Mary on this side of me, and here was Daryl on this side of me, and I'm watching two worlds going on at the same time. Here's Daryl on the other side with his hands pressed against um, like a wall saying, uh, to show me where the door is, to show me where the door is, and just show me which, uh, where the doorway is so I can come back. I need to come back. I said, Mary, he's dead. He's dead. He's standing right next to you and she turned and looked and still wasn't aware of him there like I was. I, I, I saw him as if I could touch him and I saw her knowing I could touch her. Jeanette's mother tells her daughter of the bizarre encounter she had that morning. Jeanette goes to the newsstand. She hopes this total stranger, Mary Ellen, will be able to help her find Daryl. I walked in and Mary Ellen walked up to me and she put her arms around me and just held me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Jeanette. She just kept repeating, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I am so sorry. She told me that that wasn't her and it was Daryl telling me he was, he was sorry. He was just so, so sorry. Mary Ellen explains to Jeanette it is Daryl speaking and acting through her. I said, he's standing there next to you. He's so sorry. I said, he's trying to find his way back. I said, but he can't come back. She had told me that he was shot, that we would find him, and he would have a rope around his neck. So sorry. Mary Ellen so says sorry. she became a conduit between two worlds, with Daryl pushing her to relay messages to Jeanette. Daryl kept saying to me, ghost, tell her ghost. I just said to her, does ghost mean anything to you? And she reared back and put her hand up and said, yes, that was our favorite movie. The moment she said it, I had chills from the head, from my head down to my toes. And at that moment, I knew it was him and that this was the real thing. And that no matter how much I wanted him to be here on earth with us, he was no longer. Later the same day, Mary Ellen gets another visitor, Detective Jerry Smith. Hi, Gary. How are you tonight? He's a policeman in the town just next to Sharpsville, Jerry, the town where Daryl Cozart lived. Today. When Jerry came in, I said to him, you know that guy that's missing? He's dead. First I looked there like, you know, you're nuts, you know. She says, no, I, I, I have this vision. And I see things, and, and he's laying out into a field or a swamp. It's real marshy, she said. And uh, I could see he has something around his neck, like a rope or a chain, and that uh, he's shot. And I didn't know what to make of it. And he said, how do I know he's dead? I said, well, he's standing right next to you. I thought at first she was joking. And then I could see the sincerity in her face that she wasn't joking. She believed what she was telling me, and it's bizarre. And it makes it difficult because you can't use um, apparitions or visions as testimony in any court of law as the laws as we know it. So to vow or to affirm that something is true based on a vision, the courts will not recognize it. So basically it becomes at that point and just a piece of information to guide the investigator, more of a tool than anything. 
Detective Smith decides he has to pass on the information because of Mary Ellen's credibility. It's not like some transient that just comes walking in off the street and says, hey, I had a vision. This is a, this is a business person who, who has a good reputation in the community and, and has had that business there for years. Detective Smith meets with the Sharpsville police, the neighboring police force with jurisdiction over the case. I remember saying to him, I don't think I'm crazy. I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking anything. But uh, Mary claims she had a vision, and, and the person you're looking for is deceased, and, and he was murdered. I remember the officer kind of looked at me like, yeah, you're right. I do think you're crazy. <laughs> but uh, he took the information down. Skeptical, the Sharpsville police check out Detective Smith's information. An officer visits Mary Ellen, who says Daryl is telling her what to say. Well, yes, I said he's dead. And that seemed to be what I kept saying over and over. Daryl wanted him to know where he'd been shot. And I told him I was feeling everything that he was feeling. And I felt the bullet. Despite Mary Ellen's clues, police are still not convinced this is anything more than a husband who's run off. He was such a great father. He loved his kids so much. Playing football with his son and helping his daughter learn how to ride her bike. It seemed as if uh, nobody wanted to do anything about finding this young man. It was a very frustrating time because I, I wanted answers so desperately. Mary Ellen felt Daryl was begging her not to give up. Please uh, tell them that I'm dead. Please tell them they need to be looking for me. A father of two just disappears one night in a small Pennsylvania town. Daryl Cozart's family feels something is wrong and start searching for him. From the moment psychic Mary Ellen Rodriguez first hears about the case, she says she's had Daryl as a constant companion. Every morning when I crossed the bridge into Pennsylvania, he would uh, tip my mirror down and his eyes would be looking back at me in the mirror. And I would say, good morning, Daryl. And that would begin our day. Mary Ellen believes he's trying to tell her what happened, but she can't always make sense of the clues. He's screaming it in my ear. It's fickle, it's fickle. She kept pacing back and forth and just, what do you mean fickle? What's so fickle? Who's being fickle? Daryl has now been missing for more than 72 hours. The police decide to investigate his disappearance and question people who work with him to see if they can get a lead. There were really no signs that there was any foul play because everybody they spoke to uh, liked Daryl and he was a likable person and there was really no uh, suspects as far as he didn't have any enemies. They do find one person who may have some information about that night. They had interviewed co-workers of his and one woman was uh, focused in on as being one of the last people to see Daryl. But police have no reason to suspect her. Jeanette Cozart knows Daryl's co-worker but only by her first name, Cindy or Cynthia. When I walked into the restaurant where he had worked, uh, Cindy was there. She asked me what I was doing there, and I says, I'm looking for Daryl. Have you seen Daryl? Well, no, I saw him last night. He worked here last night, and um, he took me home, but that's the last time I saw him. I'm like, okay. And then she hugged me and told me that she was sure everything was going to be all right. He'll turn up. That's not what Mary Ellen is telling Jeanette. She believes Daryl's been shot, but she can also feel that he's been hung. It's like she is experiencing what happened to Daryl. I felt like I was choking, and I wanted to pull uh, this away from my throat, so I felt that there was a rope around my neck. My forehead would itch. I start scratching my forehead, and I feel like I'm adjusting uh, a bandana on my forehead. So I began to realize that at the moment that he was murdered, he was actually wearing a bandana. It wasn't just an itchy forehead. Mary Ellen says Daryl tried to get her attention in other ways. He would start banging on my walls. Uh, my walls would start banging, and my phone would start ringing. Um, it, again, trying to get my attention of to do something. Come on, you got to do something. You, you have to do something. You, you have to call them, tell them, and I did. Driven by Daryl's desperation to be found and her desire to help Jeanette, Mary Ellen goes out searching for clues night after night. I truly went looking for the body because nobody believed me. And Jeanette was, uh, her life was in too much turmoil with uh, news media and trying to keep her children uh, calm. 
I felt like a search party of one in my off time. And I would go out looking for him, hoping that he would take me to where his body was. I feel his excitement when I'm really close to where he may be. He gets excited, like, this is it, this is it. And he'll say, this is it, here, here, here. Mary Ellen feels Daryl keeps bringing her back to one street. That's where his body was. I felt that that's where it had happened, right there in that area. Daryl acknowledged that, that it was right around in here, he said to me, it was right around in here, this is where uh, they killed me, this is where they murdered me. He was very frustrated at the lack of enthusiasm that the police department had for finding him. I didn't know how else to help him except to go out looking for him. She was determined, and I think Daryl was pushing her. Finally, after days of searching, Mary Ellen gets a signal she believes is from Daryl. I was out looking for a sign of where Daryl may be. Um, I was talking with Daryl, and I said to Daryl, please help me to help you. Show me where you may be, or even in the area, show me. When I found the sneaker, it was pointed west towards the airport, and so that may have been a sign that uh, he's either in this area or he's down that way, down uh, west to the airport. Mary Ellen was worried no one would believe her, so she doesn't tell police about the shoe, but she feels it may have been a sign after all. A week after his disappearance, police find Daryl Cozart's van near the airport. Inside the van, police discover evidence of Daryl's murder. The van had blood. He went on the side doors, there was blood on the carpet. There's only a couple ways you can get blood in there. And unfortunately, one is the person's deceased. Mary Ellen has been telling the police Daryl's dead from the beginning. So that became a validation for me. For Daryl, that was a sigh of relief that, see, now they know I'm dead. It's now a murder investigation, and police are under pressure to find Daryl's body. We didn't know exactly where he was killed or by who. The last thing you want is the public to feel unsafe, like there's a killer on the loose somewhere in a mine next. But to find the killer, the police need more evidence. Mary Ellen feels Daryl is trying to help by telling her where to find his body. They showed me a picture. There was a calendar up on my wall. It was a bog area with high grass and the, the little fence. That's where his body was. Mary Ellen knows Daryl is desperate to be found and feels him getting more and more agitated. She is shocked by what she says happened next. I'm driving to church, and he grabs my steering wheel. He says, I want to go to the police department. I want them to know I want to be buried in a gray pinstripe suit. Finally, I, I had to strike a deal with him, and I said, OK, Daryl, I tell you what. I said, you let me go to church, and then afterwards, I will drive to the police department, and we'll talk. And he conceded, and he let go of the steering wheel. So after church, Mary Ellen pays a visit to the Sharpsville police to ask why they're not checking nearby bogs, like the picture she showed them on her calendar. And I said, you, you've got a picture of where he's located. Can't you find that area? Can't you just search? Can't you go out and look? I know he's face up, and my forehead uh, is still itchy, so he's still wearing the bandana. The officer isn't convinced there's any merit to what she's saying. He said, I don't have the manpower to do that, and that could be any place. Daryl was answering all the questions. And at that point, the police officer said to me, will you tell him that if he wants to wear that suit, we better find him soon. Mary Ellen relays messages back and forth, and finally, one last bit of information from Daryl for the Sharpsville police. And he said, tell him before Tuesday. Before Tuesday morning, they will find me. Daryl Cozart has been missing now for over a week, and psychic Mary Ellen Rodriguez is convinced the police are on the verge of finding his body. Monday afternoon, all of Mary Ellen's predictions come true. 
I could feel his excitement. My hands were trembling, I was shaken. He was very excited about uh, they had found him. Another break for the police. A passing truck driver on Highway 11 near the Pennsylvania-Ohio border spots a body wrapped in plastic, dumped by the road. Daryl is found by a bog, exactly as Mary Ellen had predicted. A truck driver happened to come along down a road near a swamp and had spotted what he thought was a body laying out in this grassy area, called police, and police arrived and, and ended up being Daryl. One of the most horrific things I've had to go through in my life, losing Daryl this way, having him murdered, was hard. But telling our children was the hardest thing I have ever done. It was 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock when they found his body, and he was really excited, and my phone rang, and I said, I know, you found him, didn't you? <laughs> I already knew. And they did find him face up, and he was wearing a bandana. He was found a shot and had a rope around his neck, almost exactly the way she said he would be. Now do you believe me? <laughs> and Daryl was saying the same thing. Now do you believe me? <laughs> there was things that she described that um, would make you believe or make you suspicious that she may have been there because there was things that were not released to the press that were um, found at the crime scene that, that uh, she described. Call it coincidence, call it uh, phenomena. It's unexplained. The evidence confirms what Mary Ellen has been telling the police. The rope didn't kill Daryl. He'd been shot five times at close range with a 44 caliber gun that Daryl died a very violent death. I saw the whole thing. He showed it to me. He didn't know he was going to be killed. He didn't know that he was being set up to be murdered. The discovery of Daryl's body leads to the police getting a tip. It's from a man who has information about someone who knew Daryl. Originally, he wasn't suspicious. He just said that he asked them to move the furniture, and they went into the garage, and there was a van in there, and there was a large tarp rolled up sort of like a carpet. And he said when he asked them to move this, he can feel legs. And then that's when he says, is this an individual? Shockingly, the answer is yes, and the friend knows this person is dead. But he doesn't tell police until after the discovery of Daryl's body. Just because of friendship. He just left it go. And then when it became public as to who the individual was, and he decided that uh, he would go ahead and tell us uh, basically what he did. Mary Ellen has one unsolved clue, and it's about to make sense. It's fickle, it's fickle, it's fickle. It turns out the name of the suspected killer is Frank Fickle. The tip is from a friend of his. A few days earlier, he'd helped Fickle move a body kind of threw me for a loop, because this is one of the things Mary Ellen had told me that Daryl kept saying to her was fickle. She, he keeps repeating fickle, she would say, and I'm like, well, what's fickle, you know? And you never think of it as a, as a person's last name. With a search warrant in hand, police comb the fickle home looking for evidence. And he'll say, this is it, here, here, here. It's the same street Mary Ellen Rodriguez has been driving past looking for clues. And it was quite apparent that he was shot in that basement. The killer had tried to destroy evidence. A couple walls, you can see, had just been painted. You can see the floor has been washed down, and you can see that they were using bleach, things such as that. And some of the material was still there, so you can tell it was just fresh. But the killer hadn't been able to get rid of all of the evidence. Searching the uh, basement, I could see different fibers still clinging to the uh, cobwebs. Then as I kept on examining the area, I can see, even though there's minute, you can see buds spatter in different locations on the uh, furnace pipes. And in one place I seen up in the rafters, there was a uh, yeah, fairly good sized piece of scalp too. At the moment that he was murdered, he was actually wearing a bandana. Mary Ellen was right. Daryl had been wearing a blue bandana when he was shot. 
we found a, a bandana up in the upstairs or on the first level floor that had the bullet hole in. And it had one bullet hole in, in the same area of where he was shot. Police interview Frank Fickle's estranged wife. It turns out police have already talked to her. She's Cynthia, who worked with Daryl and was one of the last to have seen him alive. She said Daryl arrived at the Fickle home around midnight. She invited him in and sent him to the basement to smoke. But she told police she had no idea Frank Fickle was waiting there to kill Daryl. Fickle was a person who was very jealous and had made himself believe that his wife had been having an affair with Daryl. He was supposed to go down a cellar to uh, smoke some, some grass. And when he got down, the shooting took place in the basement. Frank Fickle had used his body as target practice. Frank Fickle is arrested on Wednesday, March 12, 1997, for murdering Daryl Cozart in a jealous rage. I don't even know how to explain how you feel inside when you look face to face at the man that murdered your husband and anger, frustration, just emptiness. The arrest is just a week and a half after Daryl went missing. Frank Fickle is found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Daryl didn't deserve to die. He deserved to be here to raise his children and to love his children. God put him here for a reason, and Frank had no right to take him out of God's picture. No right. Mary Ellen's involvement maybe led investigators to, to dig a little deeper, to talk to a few more people, because early in the investigation, it was just a missing person. And generally, a missing person investigation doesn't entail uh, bringing in detectives. Well, if Mary Ellen would approach me again with any information on the crime we were, we were investigating, I certainly would talk with her, and I certainly would take the information um, and give a little more weight than I would have the first time. I would not have been able to take that journey without Mary Ellen. Without her, I would have been extremely lost. And we may never have found out who, who did it. And Daryl finally did get to wear his gray striped suit at his funeral. For that, Mary Ellen is grateful. My life changed forever when I became divided between two worlds, the earth world and the spirit world. September 1975. Two con men swindle millions of pounds and vanish without a trace. The case is going cold until psychic Bob Cracknell has a vision. They're living in a cave. And they said, where? I said, Scotland. No one believes him. The police think he's a crank. You're dealing facts and that's it. But time is running out. Can the psychic find the con men before their innocent victims lose everything? The strange story of the two preachers who conned millions of pounds begins back in the 1960s when two respected middle-aged businessmen open a nursing home in the south of England. Jim Miller and John Bellard have been together since university. They are intellectuals, interested in theology. They are also lay preachers, with friends high up in the Anglican church. Miller is also a holistic therapist. He's clever, charismatic, a natural leader. Bellard is quieter, more reflective. He is the home's bookkeeper. The two men become local benefactors. They help the poor and give to charity. They are well-liked in the local community. With the success of the home, Miller and Bellard begin to expand their business interests. They set up a company selling musical instruments and indulge their taste for fast cars by sponsoring racing events. The two men are now living the high life and enjoying every minute of it. 
Then, in September 1975, the mirror cracks. Miller and Bellard fail to turn up with the prize money at a race they've sponsored. The outcry reaches the ears of Norman Luck, crime reporter with Britain's Daily Express newspaper. We had a telephone call from a number of people involved in motor racing at Brands Hatch. And they were a bit upset because their sponsor had vanished. As soon as Luck begins to sniff around, he discovers that the missing sponsorship money is only the tip of a multi-million pound fraud. Detective Constable David Fickweiler of the Sussex Fraud Squad is already on the case. They had um, entered into thousands of finance agreements um, with, fi with uh, various finance companies. The transactions allegedly were for the sale of organs to churches. In the early 1970s, an electric organ can cost up to 5,000 pounds. Churches don't have that kind of money. And finance companies will only lend to individuals. So the charismatic Jim Miller persuades his friends and employees to do a good deed for a church by signing for a loan on their behalf. The church will then repay the loan from their organ fund. Jeff Green was one of the employees who signed for a loan. You feel that you're in a small selective group that are just helping a few churches out. So on the face of it, that seemed okay. Except that the churches are completely unaware of their involvement in the scheme. With a signed agreement, Miller and Bellard collect the money for the organ from the finance company, but don't deliver anything to the church. There were many instances of the same organ being financed several times. <laughs> so uh, quite obviously, it was total fraud. At first, Miller and Bellard pay back the loans with new loans, so their friends feel reassured that their good deeds are working. And they sign more agreements. Eventually, the con men are forging their friends' signatures to borrow more money. Miller and Bellard end up borrowing over five million pounds to pay for organs that are never delivered. When the two men have borrowed up to the limit, the finance companies begin to breathe down their necks, as it is their company supplying the organs. Miller and Bellard throw a farewell party and fly off for a holiday in France. Two days later, a postcard is delivered saying they arrived safely. That is the last anyone hears of them. Shortly afterwards, Miller and Bellard's friends and employees suddenly find they are about to lose everything they possess if they don't repay the millions they have signed for. The con men have vanished, and the police have no idea where they are. So journalist Norman Luck and Detective Fickweiler decide to pool their resources to try to find them. But after a month, neither have made any progress. Then, one evening, a friend of Lux suggests he might use the help of a psychic. Psychic Bob Cracknell is keen to use his abilities to help fight the crime. I think Norman was extremely cynical at the time, you know. He was a hard-bitten journalist. Bob meets Norman Luck at his home. The journalist shows him some photographs. I think my first inference was that uh, a church connection... I, I kept saying, you know, there's a church connection here all the way through. Bob then surprises the journalist with accurate descriptions of the con men. Now, this guy, he's the weak one of the two. He's got a gammy leg. And Norman said, how can you tell that from a photograph? I was sceptical, of course I was. But there was nowhere else he could have got the information from. If he'd done some research on the situation beforehand, then possibly he would have known. Then Bob's psychic abilities astound the skeptical journalist. He senses a powerful figure at the heart of the scandal, someone high up in the church who is being blackmailed. I hadn't been told anything about the case, and I said, now there's a bishop involved. Former blackmail of some description. It's a big fraud, but it's blackmail. I was rather amazed because I didn't know how the hell he could have known that. 
That hadn't been released by the police, and it certainly hadn't been released by me. Had the psychic uncovered the bizarre connection between two fugitive conmen and a blackmailed bishop? Bob doesn't know it yet, but he's about to embark on a journey that will change his life. Two respected businessmen in southern England have vanished after conning millions of pounds from hundreds of innocent people who now stand to lose everything. The police can find no trace of the fraudsters. Psychic Bob Cracknell is sure their whereabouts have something to do with the church. Crime reporter Norman Luck is dubious of Bob's abilities until the psychic mentions a blackmailed Anglican bishop. He's an astute journalist. But I think the fact that I came up with this one thing, which he said, that's convinced me, nobody else, only I know that, I've only just found it out. And I think he said to me, you were reading my mind. Luck has been told confidentially by the police of an embarrassing story at the heart of the crime. Miller and Bellard were close friends with an Anglican bishop who was having extramarital affairs. Miller and Bellord were allowing this senior church person to use a chalet in the grounds for his various dalliances. So, this is where, this it, all is where it all happened. And this, obviously, was the, the secret behind the whole lot. Yes. The reason they started the, um, the fraudulent uh, transactions was to raise money to pay off um, what they said were a number of ladies of the night who were threatening to expose their relationship with a former bishop of Guildford. They had involved themselves in a financial scam. And with the proceeds, they were helping this senior church person to pay off blackmail demands. But then the bishop died before repaying the money leaving Miller and Bellard with a large debt. Could this have been the motive which led two men of impeccable character and no previous record into a life of deception and fraud? Staff at the home give Bob some articles of the men's clothing to see if he can sense their whereabouts. From the moment I began to touch the items, I was convinced that there was somebody close by who knew where they were, and I said no. They're not in France. They're here. They've come back. But if Miller and Bellard are not in France, who sent the postcard? Where have the two men disappeared to? Everything he sees and feels at the retirement home convinces Bob that the two con men are still in the UK. Right from the start, uh, Bob had this feeling that they hadn't come back to the UK. I, I don't think I believed it. And I think that was when Norman got his second shock, when I said, they're here. And they said, where? I said, Scotland, Ullapool. Ullapool is a fishing village on the west coast of Scotland. Where could the fugitive con men hide out in such a small place? The whole thing that was getting me throughout was church. And I'm not talking about the church organs. The connection is with the church. I know it. Miller and Bellard had always had a religious leaning. Apparently, they had often discussed becoming monks and joining a monastery. That was possibly the church connection I was looking at. They were in some monastery. They were in some religious retreat. But there is no monastery in or near Ullapool. Could he have gotten it all wrong? Detective Fickweiler, meanwhile, ransacks the nursing home searching for the money, but finds nothing. Could Miller and Bellard have taken it with them? The police interview everyone close to the con men. Of particular interest to them is Jeff Green, the manager of their racing sponsorships and one of their most trusted employees. Well, my impression of Jeff Green was that he was uh, one of those um, people that thought Miller and Bellord were, were genuine and nice people, real kindly people, and uh, I think he had been, like everybody else, conned by them. When Luck and Cracknell visit Jeff Green at his home in Brighton, 
He insists he knows nothing of the two men's whereabouts. I thought Jeff Green came over as a fair, as genuine character, that he was just another victim of the Miller and Bellord situation. After talking to Green, I was totally convinced this man was lying. They were in Scotland. He knew, and he was able to contact them. Norman, however, hard-bitten journalist, stated quite simply, sorry, without evidence, we cannot pursue it. I was devastated. What could I do? How could I convince anybody? Bob now faces a serious problem. How can he prove that Jeff Green knows where the two men are hiding? How does a psychic prove what amounts to no more than a feeling? He has only one option, to get the proof himself. Bob decides to go to the west coast of Scotland to try to find some evidence for what his psychic impressions are telling him. But I had this absolute conviction of the connection with the church. And I began to think in terms of a church as a retreat. I thought, OK, it's on an island or somewhere like that. He makes Alapool his base. From here, he plans to search the islands off the coast. He immediately sets about questioning the hotel staff. Uh, doing my amateur uh, Seamus bet, you know, have you seen this man or this man or this man? And I thought, well, you know, you've got to start somewhere. You never know. A couple of people seem to recognize the faces, but aren't certain. Bob then sets out to search the islands, showing the photographs to everyone he meets. One of the ferrymen, I mean, he was quite genuine. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, yes, I've seen this, this guy before, yeah. Quite genuine, you know, which gave me excitement. So I'm beginning to feel that I'm on the track. Bob's psychic abilities have got him on the trail of the con men. Will they lead him to their hiding place? But once out at sea, Bob's hopes take a dive. There are over 40 islands off the coast at Alapool. Finding anyone out there who doesn't want to be found could take years. With all these islands around you, where do you begin? I can well understand the reticence of the police. I, I mean, can you imagine? They're listening to a guy who's been labeled a crank saying, an island off Alapool. Yes, sir, we'll send a man out straight away. It's incredible. All Bob's psychic feelings about the men's disappearance have had a strong connection to a church or a monastery. So once back on the mainland, Bob decides to explore this link. But the nearest monastery is over a hundred miles away at Fort William. There was two people hitchhiking along the road. So I stopped and gave them a lift, a young couple. They were heading for Glasgow. Something caused me to, for some unknown reason, take the photographs out and say, look, have you ever seen these two guys? And to my absolute amazement, the girl said, oh, yes. Recognize them both. Oh, what, do you remember where you saw them? Yes, at the Royal Hotel in Alapur. That was it. I was convinced that that was the place. I was right. The witnesses give Bob the evidence he needs. It seems his psychic powers are right after all. The con men are in Olapool, exactly where he said they were. But is this enough for the police to catch them? Con men Miller and Bellard have disappeared after defrauding friends and employees of five million pounds. The police have no idea where they are. Psychic Bob Cracknell is convinced the two men are hiding on an island off the west coast of Scotland. But no one believes him. So he goes there himself to look for them. And finds evidence that the fugitives are in the area. With renewed confidence, Bob returns to London with the names and addresses of his witnesses. He's sure the police can now catch the con men and the Daily Express can print the story. But Bob's in for an unpleasant surprise.
Back in London, Norman Luck and the Daily Express are not impressed. That wasn't sufficient proof. You can't say, I think. You've got to either produce a body and say, they are staying at so-and-so, so-and-so guest house. We have found the Southern Organ Foresters. But that didn't happen. After all his hard work, Bob hits a dead end. No one wants to listen. The con men will get away with it, and their victims will lose everything. His dream of a career fighting crime is fading fast. I knew that I was right. It became a, a personal thing, you know. I, I, I really didn't know what to do. I'd gone out on this limb, whereas a psychic takes in all forms of vibrations, adverse and otherwise. When a psychic gets depressed, believe me, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's doubly worse. And then, as the case begins to go cold, Bob receives a final psychic clue about the con men's whereabouts. I had a dream in which these two guys were living in a cave, in a desolate area, you know, definitely living in a cave. It was such a vivid dream. There was no question or doubt about it. I woke up convinced, as a result, that they had been living in a cave. Well, this is a bossy, as near to a cave as you can possibly imagine. But the west of Scotland is peppered with these stone huts. How is the psychic going to convince anyone to search them all? Bob phones Norman, but the journalist is away. In desperation, he tells Detective Fickweiler about his dream. But Fickweiler's response to the idea that someone with five million pounds would be living in a stone hut is less than enthusiastic. We deal in facts. And um, if someone says, I think, I believe, um, I know things, well, then you ask them what they know. And if they can't come up with anything, why should one waste time pursuing it? Yeah, cynical, um, sceptical. Uh, yeah, most coppers are. Um, you deal in facts and that's it. The police are a funny breed. Unless it's written down or unless they can see it with their own eyes, um, they don't believe it. It's now nearly a year since the con men have disappeared. Have they vanished into thin air? The police have exhausted all their avenues of investigation. Yet they still won't listen to a psychic. It'll take a lot more than a dream to convince them that Bob isn't a crank. And then a stroke of luck. Bob's persistence is vindicated. Jeff Green feels let down by his friends and employers, and the pressure from the finance companies demanding repayment has become too much to bear. I trusted these guys. I thought, yeah, they'll be OK, they're going to come back. I know where they are, they're going to come back, they're going to put it all right, and so on. And of course, two, three months, four months, getting into the fifth month, and nothing's happening, all these reps are flying, your health goes down, your marriage breaks up, you're going to lose your house, and this makes you think about it all in a different way. Green's account of Miller and Bellard's disappearance is extraordinary. After landing in France, they made their way back uh, on the ferry to Dover, where Jeff Green picked them up, drove them all the way up to the west coast of Scotland from Ullapool. They set sail in two dinghies to an island called Priest Island. Here was the church connection Bob had tried so hard to find. The two men were living in a stone hut on Priest Island, four miles off Ullapool. The psychic's powers were absolutely on target. Gives me chasing my backside on islands, connection with the church. Alapur was the location. I was there. The living in the cave was correct. I believe Norman's headline story was living in a cave, eating cockle soup. But now I would have, you know, I would have gone and got an ordnance map of the whole area and checked it out. And Priest Island would have stuck out like a sore thumb, would it not? It took us hours to get there, and when we got there, we were thrown up against some rocks because we couldn't control the boat. The seas were too rough. In the end, we were thrown into a small cove. Green returned home, and the 
two conmen in their 50s set up camp in the roofless stone hut. They stayed there for nearly eight months throughout a sub-zero winter, perhaps to make amends for the chaos and misery they'd unleashed. The two spiritual swindlers simply turned their backs on the world. They, they left everybody, and, and when you leave somebody that trusts you and has great faith in you and wants to um, still keep you in their lives, it's, 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 it's a terrible thing. Why should he cover up for these people when he was one of their victims? When Miller and Bellard ran out of money and provisions, they returned to the mainland and moved into a caravan. They phoned Jeff Green to send them more money. Their lack of contact before that and the fact that he and others had suffered so much in their absence incensed Green. He gave them up. At their trial, both men plead guilty. With no previous offenses, they are given six years each. The bishop's wife is still alive, so his name is never mentioned. And the millions, they say, were all spent repaying loans and enjoying a brief taste of the high life. None of the money was recovered. There was no indication in the books and records as to where all the money had gone. It seems Bob Cracknell's visions had been right from the start. The con men had returned to Britain from France and hidden on an island off the west coast of Scotland. Priest Island, due to its name, did have a connection with the church, and the two men had been living in a primitive stone dwelling, not entirely unlike a cave, and perhaps the pressure, psychic and otherwise, which Bob put on Jeff Green might even have encouraged his confession. I think that possibly Green said, this guy's not going to let go. I can't take it. This case changed Bob's life. He became known as the psychic detective and spent the next 30 years fighting crime. Basically, you are aware of atmosphere, feelings, vibrations that the average person is not aware of. Like a radio, if you like, uh, you know, um, on shortwave. With all the crackling and noise going along, you've got to go along and turn it in and bang, you're on the station. <laughs> 